Thanks for joining us. Got your six Lads Advice Encounters with me, Gab Doffy and friends. Today I'm joined by Gary and Dallas. Gary is joining us all the way from Cape Town. Uh, he stars in a film that's still on Netflix. I really advise you to watch this. It's really, really brilliant. Uh, Shepherds and Butchers uh, with Steve Coogan. He was also in The Prisoner, in Game Changers, alongside Daniel Radcliffe, uh, in Troy, and in Serenity. Gary and thanks for joining us and welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for having me, Gav. Uh, it's been a long time coming. Absolutely, we've been we've been struggling to to track each other's schedules and get something in the in the diary. But here we are. It's really good to speak to you, mate. And thanks for joining us straight from work. Uh, how's your day been so far? Uh, it's been good. I mean, I've just been behind the bar since this morning, so just making people coffees, pouring people beer. Nice, nice, nice. Sounds fun to be fair, and in the sunshine as well, by the sounds of it. Yeah, no, it's extremely hot this side. Ah, uh, yeah, back for a run. It's absolutely throwing it down with rain and freezing cold here in Cambridge, but. Um, Perhaps we'll trade places at some point. So I wanted to speak to you, first of all, you know, where did all this start? You, you started acting at age 10, I think. Uh, yeah, um, I think uh, it was around seven when I, I did the, pri- no, it must have been eight, seven, eight when I did uh, The Prisoner. But um, I actually started dancing first. So it all began with um, ballet at six years old because I wanted to be Billy Elliot. I'd watched the film. And I was obsessed. Um, and then I started getting bullied a bit in school. I guess that kind of helped with uh, dealing with everything that comes with being in the entertainment industry. Um, and then my dad's an actor and my mom's a drama teacher. So it was kind of inbuilt. If, if I didn't take drama as a subject, my mom said I was going to sleep in the doghouse outside, you know. <laughs> so the family business. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, it's it's not always financially as secure, but we all wanted to sing and dance, so we all kind of in the same boat. So can we talk a bit about that then? The you were you were doing ballet at age seven. You really loved it. You wanted to be next Billy Elliot, but there was some bullying at school. What was that about? Is that that sort of the the whole toxic masculinity piece? Or oh yeah, no. I mean, wherever you go, all over the world, there's always going to be an element of that. Uh, what a man needs to be and what a man should be and the whole stereotypical thing. Um, but what I really liked, I think, um, obviously you guys will know, is Tom Holland, uh, who's now currently Spider-Man, uh, was in Billy Elliot, Billy Elliot himself. So that was quite inspiring for me too. I like that there's a, there's a whole bunch of us. <laughs> Absolutely. And so like, in terms of that, you know, and those ideas around masculinity and, and taking, you know, that step into learning ballet and then being bullied, did that put you off? Were your, were your, your parents in the industry were able to offer some advice on, on sort of how to cope with all of that or, or what ultimately happened? Have you, are, you, are you still dancing now? Um, I remember a very specific Thursday when my dad was coming to fetch me afterwards and the boys were bullying me, some of the boys that were playing soccer. Um, and weirdly enough, the Springbok rugby team had just done a ballet class on TV the night before. Um, and they'd all struggled with it. So it was this perfect blend of, well, you know, the, the, the Springboks have just done a ballet rugby class and they all, uh, it's, it's helping them with their athleticism. And then the other point was that I was hanging out with the girls more than any other six-year-old, you know. <laughs> <anyway. laughs> so eventually, I mean, if you, if you look at it logically, you're the one, you know, lifting them in tutus while the other guys laugh at you. I think, yeah, it's, it's a shame that even, you know, you have to make any justification you're doing uh, an athletic sport that takes a lot of skill um and you know, that for me is the top and the bottom of it but it's, it's interesting how we sort of try to paint people into these thinly defined roles and yeah so i mean have you, have you continued with any dancing now or? i was very lucky to have a, a teacher in high school who uh, put me in a lot of her productions so i mean not as much these days but when i was around 14 to uh, 17 19 i was doing Salsa and modern, contemporary, jazz, and a bit of hip hop, but I'm not as good. <laughs> That's cool. And do you, you sing as well? Um, yeah, I love singing. Um, I had a band together actually in um, 2014, 2015. And we've got one uh, song kind of demo that's out on SoundCloud, but we broke, we split up around 2015. Cool. What's the, what's the band calling? Let's chat that out. Um, Mal- Malin Avenue. <laughs> Appreciate that. Thanks, man. Nice, man. Nice. Awesome. Okay, so is that like sort of guitar playing, singing, that, that, that sort of... Um, the, the one track that's online is called Moment in Madness or Moment of Madness by Mellon Avenue, and I was the vocalist. So they never used to let me play guitar, which was <laughs> always quite bleak, man, because that's my obsession at the moment. I think I've, I've, I've graduated into guitar and uh, 
yeah, that's my therapy. <laughs> Pretty cool, man. And um, so, do you, do you teach or anything? Is that a route that you might go down with the guitar? Or? Teaching guitar would actually be lovely, um, specifically because there's no, you know, there's every guitar teacher is different. Um, but when it comes to teaching, I'd probably my brother's an English teacher in Vietnam at the moment, so I've just got in my TEFL. Um, and when it comes to teaching, I'm trying, I'm hoping to get into that kind of crowd. Um, go sort okay. of in Vietnam for like six months to a year. Yeah, I, was, I, I taught English in, in a place called Binh Yung in, uh, in Vietnam, close to uh, to Saigon. Where's your whereabouts is your brother? Um, he, I know he was in Hanoi for a while, but I think he's in Da Nang now. Nice. Oh, okay. Yeah. No, that's cool. Well, yeah, talk to me after if, you, if your brother's got you some links in the north, he might be able to give you some in the south. I don't know how much Thank traveling you. you plan to do, but no, I appreciate that, guys. Thanks. So you spoke um, about the, the the bullying at school, sort of helping you to deal with some of the pressures of of uh, being in the industry uh, and acting. There's lots of press uh, and sort of public debate about you know younger people and, and children being involved in that industry. Sure. Is yeah. that easier if you've got family that can sort of prepare the way and, and sort of help you out with what to expect and and in some ways shield you from that? Or what's your experience been of sort of being in the limelight from from age seven? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, speaking personally, I think having uh, parents, um, being able to be on sets with my brother when he was, because he was also a, a bit of a child star. So I'd go on to film sets that he was busy with and I've got the chance to realize who's doing what role, what departments are, what certain lingo means. And um, obviously that makes it a lot less of uh, a daunting environment. It's a little bit more familiar. Um, but I, I suppose it always comes down to the community of people making the film. Um, because even as a kid, I had, there's some some groups of people making a film that really make it special for kids and uh, look after them and watch the times and, you know, try to keep it special, keep it light, keep it fun. And then there's other, you'll do other jobs where it's a little bit more of a, a business or financially run um, project. And, you know, you're kind of, your contract will be signed and you'll fall by the wayside. Um, so yeah, I think it, it all comes down to that uh, paternal kind of care that the director or the, the person you're acting with has, I suppose. So it's bit, a bit more about individuals than it would be about uh, individuals making the film than it would be about the people you know before. Sure, and you've taken on some pretty sort of, you know, heavy uh, political roles uh and films you know particularly game changers and, and shepherds and, and butchers yeah how has that been for you in terms of i don't know what it's like in south africa with the press the press here can be can be pretty unpleasant um uh, and pretty intrusive is that have you, have you experienced any of that or have you, have you been pretty much you know okay with it i was i was really surprised um by the reception to shepherds and butchers and i think um Obviously, when you when I read the script um, and I saw the character, and it's a young white male who's killed seven people um, of another race, and you reading the script, you think he's guilty. So my first obstacle was kind of how do I see eye to eye with somebody who I disagree with or who at at the first glance I have an issue with a certain character. Um, and I realized very early on it was it, it was very important to tap into his humanity as much as possible, um, even though he's quiet throughout that film. So I think um, what really surprised me with Shepherds was that its reception was very, very personal. Um, and instead of it being a big uh, a political debate, people used to come up to me with their own stories. Um, people from all different backgrounds and races and walks of life. And it was always people who either had secrets that they had to keep from family or people who had worked for the old government that still said there's more and more things coming to the, the light now that, you know, were hidden and uh, kept secrets. And I mean, yes, there's a, a Pandora's box of stories, I'm sure, behind every government. Um, but that film specifically, I think it was the first time you could watch a film about a young white boy during apartheid in South Africa. And the film's 
trying to get you to feel sorry for him. I think that was the first time that was ever looked at or looked at another side. And I think it was a very risky move on their part. I mean, had it, 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 when I looked at the script, obviously I had my fears and I didn't want it to be looked at wrongly or for people to put my face to the character, you know? Um, but what I found was the, was, the, was the conversations with the guys I was doing the stunts with, you know, and the, the, the two weeks of riots in a, a prison, but, but juxtaposed with these scenes we're shooting, we're having these really in-depth conversations together as the new South Africa. And just about, not only, it was, it was quite educational because we we're going through this and not only hearing about it, but living it and experiencing and seeing this ugliness and it being so in contrast with who we were when the cameras weren't on. I think that was what made the film very special for me. Yeah, and you said uh, brave on the part of the, the people shooting the film, actually pretty brave on your part to take that role with the, the potential with such you know difficult subject matter um, for the way that it might be received. Were you, were you worried by that at all? And, and what made you sort of ultimately take the decision to go with it? So I think uh, more than anything, it was uh, Oliver Schmidt who convinced me to uh, be in the film because he himself was from South Africa. Um, and he was a DJ in Cape Town where I'm living um, around the time of apartheid. And I think he, he, he's moved to Germany just to get away from all the constant, you know, political issues that we've had to face in South Africa, whether it be in constant conversation. And uh, it, I, I gather he didn't agree, obviously, with what was going on and he's stayed in Germany, but he came back to South Africa and he's done some really good films like Sarafina and um, another one I really loved, uh, Parish Tame. So when I found out that he was going to be directing, I knew there was something he had seen within the script that he had also glimpsed was very important to tell. Um, and obviously, back to your question, there's always going to be people who want, want the message to go towards one thing or the other thing. But what I loved about the film is there were so many people who were finding their own message within the film. And I think those are more important films to make than one that is a, a solid, clear message. It needs to be one where you can go in and find your own message and come out. Well, I think it was, uh, as we've spoken about before off mic, it was incredibly well done. Did they already have you in mind for the role? Actually, there uh, there were a few callbacks I'd come to where um, I'd heard, I won't mention any names, but one of the producers wasn't keen on me um, for Leon, which I can't completely understood. Um, anyone who had seen my headshot would have seen me as that <laughs> Zeba esque 16-year-old looking boy. You know, I'd never done anything to the degree of Leon. And I, I was 18 at the time of shooting. So, I mean, they were still putting shoe polish on my moustache and stuff. <laughs> that wasn't real. So, um, what eventually got me the role, thank God, was uh, Oliver had a really good feeling about me and wouldn't let it go. And um, through a couple more callbacks, eventually what they did is they got a makeup artist to come in as well and age me a bit. And then when uh, they agreed and I got the role, I was put on a training program for about two months, three months to put on as much um, weight as I could. So I was training every day from eight, and nine. Um, I was eating more than I could. You know, and you feel you just feel sick all the time. You're just trying to put on that mass as quickly as possible. So, yeah, it was it was a lot of work um, to get away I from that year old boy <laughs> to Leon Labuschagne. Yeah. Yeah. No. 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 Putting on putting on weight is not a problem for me. I have to just look at a piece of cake <laughs> and then uh, <laughs> that's why I just come back from running. But I mean, I mean, ultimately, you know, it, it's a film that that deals with um, racial tensions, violence, prejudice, but but also deals with you know, the issue of, of the death penalty. Um, mm. it, and I think it's really interesting because often you'll speak to people when there's been a, a, a particularly nasty or, 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 or violent crime that's happened and they'll say, oh, you know, bring back, you know, hanging or bring back the death penalty. And I think that's, you know, often when something horrible has happened or someone's done something that you, that you, that you can't imagine ever doing, 
it, it's easy to go to that place but but what shepherds does is it sort of presents you with that <laughs> with that you know up close and personal uh yeah and i think that's powerful yeah i think i mean that yeah exactly what you were saying there's a there's a a point where you have to get to a point of anger or frustration or at, at a certain person and their crime to want the death penalty to get to that level and even in that heated moment you know you may feel differently afterwards but moreover what i loved that, that the film did was if you implement these things in society like the death penalty and we're all considering just the person who is going to be on the gallows the person is going to be killed we have to understand that these systems have to be run by people too so everything that we decide as a society is normal it's going to affect everyone who has who's implemented in that entire chain you know what i mean so it's not even just about the death penalty and these people who's who are losing their lives but it's the people who are making the entire machine work everyone who has to deal with the things that come with the death penalty everyone who has to deal with the moral dilemma everyone who has to deal with seeing people and the next and getting to know them in the next day helping them you know be hanged and i think that was also what i loved about the film was it was it didn't just look at the death penalty as a straight debate it was okay here's the death penalty it could be anything that we're talking about um but if we implement this it not only affects these two people but there's going to be a ricochet effect and not only will it be those people who are you know the guards and the warders who are dealing with it but it's going to be their children too because of how dad treats me because of how dad's spending his day and it's going to be the wife as well because of how her husband's treating her and then how the wife treats her friends or her colleagues and it's just it's 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 a yeah i like i liked the responsibility it placed on society as a whole to give things a go ahead or to just take a second look at the ripple effect or the implementations on a broader degree 100% and i think it's important what you're saying that i recently reread albert pierpoint's book he was the, the the last hangman before we we got away with the death penalty in in the uk uh, and it's a conversation I had recently on, on, on Facebook where, as I say, something pretty horrific had happened to a child and, and, the, and the conversation was why are we, you know, uh, paying to put people who commit these types of crimes into prison and not, and not just bringing back the death penalty. And you're right, there is that knock on. And obviously, um, the podcast comes from Lads Advice, uh, which is a, a peer support group for, for young men who might talk to access support and help on Facebook. <clears throat> and in terms of what you're talking about, absolutely these knock-ons do happen and we know that directly you know anecdotally from the group as well as from the research so there was a there was a young man in particular where uh his dad had been away to war uh, and come back with ptsd and that resulted in ultimately family breakdown uh and sort of you know physicality within the family that that then led to a situation where you know the domino effect was that he ultimately ended up uh, attempting to take his own life so I think you're absolutely right, and and it's easy, isn't it, to get focused in when you, with emotion when talking about these subjects and not really consider that broader context. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, the broader context wasn't spoken up about enough, which is why I, I'm glad things like um, you guys exist. You know, um, just the fact that PTSD has been debated as a, as a real thing, how that can even be debated as a real thing. It's like if you get splashed with water, you get wet, you know? And if, if you go yeah. through a trauma, you have PTSD. But for some reason, we, some people don't look at those two as equal statements. And I don't understand why. I think it is. It's, it's, it's very important that we make it more and more of a, a, a conversation and that people understand. Just as you get wet from water or anything that happens in life, these things are just as real. And we have the people here to show you. So, yeah, sorry, I just wanted to harp on that point. No, no, I completely agree, you know, and, and we know as well in terms of PTSD and things like adverse childhood experiences have massive impacts then on mental health uh, and, you know, and social difficulties moving forward for people. So I think, you know, having these conversations is really, really important. A lot of Shepherds was shot in the dock and it was sort of up close, <laughs> camera in your face, looking yeah. at your reactions to the developing court case. Yeah, and you just pull it off 
incredibly well. The, the gravity and emotion of the film, I've, I've rewatched it Cheers. lots Thank of times and, and, and showed it to lots of friends and they all felt the same way. How do you go about conveying all of that with <laughs> when you've just got a camera and a, and a dock? I mean, I mean, what 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 training and background and research did you put into managing to pull that off? I mean, I I, I will have to admit I was very lucky with Shepherds um, to have <clears throat> Leah Stryker behind the camera, probably one of the best DOPs I've ever worked with. Um, she really worked with me and felt me and 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 got on got free cam and got in my face and got in coffins with me and you know so i think that was a big part of it and without her i would i would never have been able to be as comfortable that close as i was mm. um but also another thing i always remember from shepherds because shepherds was my first um lead role and first kind of over 18 now i'm in a film doing this by myself type of thing and um yeah. I just remember being so exhausted during that film because in that character specifically, he's he's so internal. Yeah. And there's he's kind of we're not even seeing him just with like in recent um we're not even seeing him close to the, the recent events that have happened. We're seeing him after being in a cell for you know a couple of months, I think it was six months since. Mm -hmm. So he's only gone through what he's done, he's repressed things and he's been in silence for so long that that's the way he's used to existing at that point in time so my brain was firing off i mean whatever i could i just needed to make sure it was firing off something i didn't i didn't want the camera to catch me not thinking or to catch me trying to convey something i just had to keep keep those thoughts and i remember it was it was a very 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 tiring film um and it was a hard one for all of us i think from makeup to wardrobe to the it, everyone I remember being so stressed by the end of that film that I don't think we would have gotten through it if it wasn't for just the the, the keeping each other going and the the, the, the teamwork and the, I think a lot of what what the, the final outcome of that film was the passion that kept everyone going in each of their departments um, just during through that time because it was not an easy film to make for sure, and yeah, and as I say, it comes across, you know, and this might be in some ways frustrating, uh, or you know, the mark of a good actor, but it comes across completely effortless, um, and and the mm. subtlety is, is just just incredible. Um, Thanks. Guys. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I've got a, one of the questions here that's been put down by by one of the the undergrads that I spoke to about interviewing him. He says, he said, do you think that any blame is attributable to the character? What's your what's your take home message from? from uh shepherd in relation to your character oh uh, the cat any blame i mean mm. for sure there wouldn't be i mean that was what i was trying to to, to harness was his humanity you know and there, there, there is no humanity within us without mistakes or blame or wrong wrongness you know if we were all these divine creatures that did everything right we'd just have this glow in our eye and you know carrots up our eyes I think so I do I, I always I mean right from the get-go felt he was to blame and I felt it was going to be a very difficult thing for anyone to care about him by the end of the film and uh for me so quite right I I, I felt he was very to blame and for me the film from the beginning to end the process I tried to get through was understanding him more and more myself and trying to feel more sorry for him myself so it was a big contrast from when I first read the script to when I was in it and I was there especially on the last days when I understood okay they, they, there's you know he, there's so many elements to this he's a kid he's 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 got damage <laughs> he's he's got only what he's known to draw on he's you know it, it's almost like if he didn't if I played him in a, in, in a way that seemed to in, more intense or more developed or more of like a someone who thinks anything of himself you know because I don't think he did think anything of himself by the end of that um, then he would have come across a lot harder to feel sorry for but I think what Leon kind of symbolizes is going into something following all the rules 
thinking you're doing the right thing and then seeing the bigger picture and then feeling more lost than you, you were right at the beginning, you know? And so I, I think yeah, that, that complexity comes across really, really well. And that's another thing I think that as, as human beings, we often are keen to draw a binary. So this person did that thing, therefore they're evil or bad. And, you know, it's multifaceted. First of all, I think it's very possible to be a good person and do a bad thing and vice versa. Uh, and I think also, um, <laughs> you know, this digs into the into the reason. And there's there's the the, the sort major in the background, sort of pulling the strings, which you which you convey well in in the in the inside court, uh, as well as in sort of the, the, the flashbacks that we see in the film. Uh, and and really, you know, as the arguments made by by his legal team, he himself has experienced a form of, of institutional violence on the part of you know the regime and that's then that's ultimately what, what's led to the position that he finds himself in um which you know and all that's conveyed pretty much from the dock which i think is is a, is a real achievement um and as i say i can't recommend can't recommend watching the film enough to anyone that hasn't already watched it and then the game changes so again you know sort of pretty controversial themes uh, and it's in relation to Grand Theft Auto. And in Britain, it says, you know, the police federation branded it as sick and contemptible. Uh, Hillary Clinton called it the stealing of innocence of our children. This is Grand Theft Auto. Uh, you know, and then there's the attempt to get the game banned. And this this film, The Game Changers, follows um, follows that story. What, what do you are your views on that? How instrumental can the media be in stirring up anger? Um, you know, what was your take home by the time you finished shooting that film on on the the topics it covered? Sure. I mean, yeah, that was that was literally two or three months before Shepherd. So we we we, we also shot that in Cape Town, um, and that was really interesting for me because I. I'm a huge Rockstar Games fan. I mean, at the time of making the film, I was playing uh, San Andreas on my phone. I think Bill, Bill Paxton's character and conversations with him, he was really, um, Tim, I was really fortunate to meet him before he passed. Um, it wasn't long after that, but he was really dedicated to his craft and the way he was going about his character, which kind of represented this alternate perspective on the whole thing you know to mine made me look at it uh more than i would have that perspective and i think i understand both sides yep. <laughs> i understand the need for entertainment to make art and um i understand a need to protect and to censorize but through through censorship sometimes we are uh, portraying something we're trying to we, we don't need more of and <laughs> I think that's a that's a, that's ironic in itself but then there's also the side of Rockstar Games and Sam Hauser truly being an artist and being a huge fan of films and wanting to create something beyond what we have now I mean but when, when we had books and then we had radio and no one had television and when television was on the cusp of you know being made and there was there's films and no one knew to the extent that was going to dominate the world um, and it was on that brink and I like to think of video games and a lot of uh, VR and 3D work we're doing now as that same way the same way records suddenly could have eight tracks on them um, and then suddenly that changed the whole way people viewed music and who popular who was popular and how fast it traveled so. I feel like it's important to look at Grand Theft Auto and works, other works of uh, Rockstar Games like Red Dead Redemption as almost a dawning of a different type of artistic experience rather than something to fear um, taking control of our children, you know? And obviously there are aspects to both of those and being desensitized to things um, and, you know, being in a game where if you're seeing it as a simulation, as, as opposed to 
a piece of artwork or entertainment that you're, you're trying to get a message out of, which we were talking about earlier, but you're looking at it as a simulation and you put your own personal things into your story as you go, then those lines might start to blur. And I understand there's a problem there. I mean, uh, as a kid on PlayStation 2, I remember getting so into all of my games and uh, the kids now, I could just imagine them playing what we have available. So there's, there's, there's a level of responsibility from the censorship to understand that. And there's a level of responsibility from the artist to understand the censorship, I feel. So both are quite valid. So do you think there's a problem then sort of in terms of almost fetishization and sort of taking on these roles that, 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 that we know are sort of extreme and, and not accepted in society and then living them vicariously through a game? And if so, do you think that there's a danger that that desensitization moves over for some people into real life? Or would you say that it's more an issue of um, context and audience and making sure, you know, that, that these these types of, of, of art or game are aimed at adults or people who have got the, the experience to be able to contextualize them in such a way that's, that's, that's helpful and not harmful? What, what would you say? Yeah, no, I, I, on that point completely, I feel there is a bit of a problem with uh, money coming into the picture and obviously financial gain. And um, you, you, you want to limit these products like Grand Theft Auto Online or Red Dead Online ideally it should only be for people over 18 who can understand and grasp the whole situation. And that this is a, you know, they, we've, we all played the ones leading up to these ones and it's, it's video games and we're going into new technology on video games and it's this exciting new world, you know? And um, the fact that there are so many kids under 18 online is just because obviously there's a huge broad target market that, video game companies can't say no to that. It's, it's like halving, maybe even more than halving their incomes. So I think there's this, this moral debate we've got to have with how, how, how far do we go monitoring what uh, children are allowed to play certain games if they are not of the appropriate age. And if we aren't going far enough with that, then that might be the reason why kids are being exposed to these things. And it does come down to parents, of course, but at the same time, it should also come down to the person who created the product. And um, yeah, I think I, I, I agree that there should be a little bit more of a regulation um, and that companies that have more, already have enough money, don't need to have that many people on their platform without making, ensuring that they are of the appropriate age. I, I think Grand Theft Auto, and a few other games that use realism as opposed to it being like a bubble gummy fun commercial type of uh, alternative world you know if it's a if it's based off realism you've got to be very very careful with what age you're exposing children to what you create because then it's com comparative with reality immediately for sure yeah and i think you know as, as you say if we're assuming that then we're we're targeting an adult audience in many ways, you know, and this is, we have some rules on, on, on the Lads Advice group around sort of talk, political talk and religious talk, just because we want to keep it a harmonious space. But, you know, for the most part, uh, for me, in most spaces and, 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 you know, in most environments, better to inspire and have that conversation and that debate, uh, you know, so that we can have meaningful discussions about it than to suppress uh, and, 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 and edit stuff out uh, and so the discussion doesn't happen you know and, and then in, in many ways i think that could be more harmful exactly yeah that the the, the 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 fact that censorship and suppression in themselves are something that <laughs> might need to be looked at you know what i mean that that, that they that they're a solution but in the same time a problem totally so you you took on these two roles as i say shepherds and butchers and, and the game changers both are pretty sort of heavyweight in terms of social moral and political content uh, uh you know and, and could potentially be quite thought-provoking or contentious are these is that the reason you've taken those roles is that the way that you sort of you see yourself in terms of developing your acting career moving forwards or is it just a case-by-case -case basis that you you sort of resonated with and were interested in these films yeah i mean I, I, i'd like to say it's not a case-by-case -case thing but i mean at the end of the day work isn't in abundance here so we will 
all go for if there's a decent half decent job we'll all be going for it um but there was also someone who i can't fail to mention um named munin lee who is a big big part of why i still want to be an actor and why i did in the first place um and she was very selective particularly when i was 18 uh, about which projects i get on and i mean i owe a lot of ever being able to be in a film to her but I think she she was very selective with those two projects uh, that year. Quite specifically, she wanted me to choose projects that, yeah, would would, would be meaningful um, and put me in a position to be recognised. So I think those were her two her two fundamentals for me taking on those roles. And um, I was just really lucky because because uh, as I said, they were both on the same day. Game Changers and um, Shepherds and Butchers. And I obviously didn't think I was going to be getting either of them, not never list both of them on the same day. But um, what happened was Game Changers was the first audition and then they thought we'd just try um, some uh, Shepherds and Butchers. And there's a, a quite a funny story there. I had a friend, um, Tabo, who played... Solomon Mushlangu in a really, really good film uh, called Kalushi, which is like very, very much the other side of the um, Pretoria Maximum prison. And um, it's a really, really good film. And anyone who's listening should go check it out. But he was auditioning for Solomon. And uh, Solomon is at the same prison being, it's a real man, um, He's, he's quite a martyr. He's very, very, very uh, well respected in South Africa. And um, he was put uh, given a death sentence at the exact same prison where Leon Labuskatni worked. So for our auditions, he was on the gallows and I had to hold his uh, sleeve as we do. And obviously it's me with uh, Tabo and the emotions kind of just took hold of us. It was just this, and I, I owe a lot to him for that as well, but it was just the surreal, he, he's being the person who has to go through the hanging and I have to be the person who's going through, through the hanging from the other side. And there was, these were two separate films that split off and were made afterwards. But for that audition, I was lucky that he was there because he came in for me and we did that simulation together. And I think that's what helped um, the director see any kind of valid emotion in my eyes, you know. That's an amazing synchronicity. I mean, what what happened with Leon in, in real life? Do you know? In the end. Um, so that was another thing. I mean, this the, I owe a lot of uh, shepherds and butchers to the preparation. It was quite quite difficult to not have something to show, and um, that's all to all credit to do with uh, Oliver and Munin. But um, I had to go meet him when. I was busy training, so it was about a month or two before we started shooting. And I went to I went on the car train up to Pretoria, and wow, it was an incredibly, um, you know, hum humbling and eye-opening and surreal experience. Um, I obviously won't delve into every detail, but um, it was just it was so valuable to meet somebody who has seen it, who has been there, who has lived it, because I was able to see his eyes. And um, yeah. That's it was pretty just, incredible. Like, I mean, how old is he now? Um, I think he was in his 50s, but I'm not sure. I must double check them. Um, but obviously, the, the, the stories in Shepherds and Butchers are a mix of uh, a few guys. So he 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 wasn't the one uh, with the road rage road rage incident. There was another guy who lost it and uh, fired seven shots and was killed. Um, it was another one of his friends, but he was um, the one who was at maximum at seventeen years old. And um, yeah, sure. Ah, okay, so it's sort of an intertextual story. I mean, having met the people that that were directly involved, and then you know you also sort of charged with telling their story that that could be quite a weight to carry did you did you feel you know how did you how did you feel about carrying that responsibility having met him um fearful i guess <laughs> i wanted to make sure that i portrayed him 
how I wanted to portray him um, balanced with how he wanted me to portray him. You know what I mean? Um, especially all films when it's a real person or based around a real person, you've got to be careful because you want you need to have that character as your own and for yourself but you know that that if that person's going to watch it then it's another another kind of balance you need to find so it was interesting and uh, i took as many notes as i could from him and um i think yeah i think there was a really interesting uh week he came to visit set actually when we we're doing the prison rights those last two weeks and um, we're practicing stunts with the same stunts guys I mentioned before who we had a really, really good relationship with. Uh, shame. They were all having nightmares that week and wondering how I was getting on. But by then it was three months in for me. So I was very used to the material. But anyway, so the real guy arrives on set and we're rehearsing stunts the day before. And uh, he has to come onto the mat and show us how to do a proper lock, a proper head hold with one of the inmates. And he grabbed the, the stunt guy and it, you could almost feel the uncomfort. Um, and there's just this moment of silence for all of us because we had all been, I mean, it's here, it's us on a mat, rehearsing, just doing stunts, trying to get ready for the shoot. And then boom, it's real all of a sudden. And there was just this deafening silence. And I think after that, we were all we were quite reminded just how real our material was. It's pretty powerful. I'm in terms of taking these types of roles as well, you know, I know on um, Game Changers, you work with Daniel Radcliffe. He, it's a bit of a double-edged sword, isn't it? When you, when you get a really big role, uh, and I know he spent an awful lot of time trying to, <laughs> trying to shed uh, the, the the veil of Harry Potter and, and show that he's, you know, has more complexity perhaps or, or more diversity as an actor than Harry Potter. Um, how was it working with him? And and you know. How do you view that yourself in terms of your acting career, in terms of making sure that you are able to, on the one hand, take work that, that that is good for you, and on the other hand, you know, keep you know the diversity if that's what you want. Yeah, I mean, uh, unfortunately, uh, I didn't get to hang around him too much, but I did. I, I got a lot of stories, and from uh, what I can tell, he's a really, really, really good guy, uh, really, really down to earth. Uh, but obviously, as you mentioned, he has this the shadow following him of his former character that he's got to kind of um, be wary of. And uh, it's it's strange. I was having a conversation with Steve Coogan actually about that that same year because obviously Daniel had left and then Steve had just come down. And it's uh, he's obviously got Alan Partridge, so he understands to a degree. Um, for me, I think I think obviously Daniel Radcliffe's awesome. I think he's gone about it in the best way possible, going on stage and being fearless. And I, I think he's really been grabbing as many out there roles as he can, um, which I mean, you know, credit to him. And I hope he keeps going with it. Um, but you could compare it to him as uh, you know Elijah Wood with Frodo, or um, you know, there's a lot of actors that have that one role where they, they 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 kind of hit a peak it's like peaking in high school and then everyone seems to only favor that character and as i mean me personally if i had to ever get a character like that um i'm at the point where i'm 25 now so if i if i was in a position where i had one fundamental character everyone associated me with but because of that one character I could still be now working and choosing whatever roles I wanted to do, trying to push, you know, that metal. Then I don't think it would bother me as much. Um, but obviously, speaking about uh, actors like Daniel Radcliffe, who are as young as they were when it started, he hasn't known anything else, and he hasn't really been given any breathing room. So uh, I, I could imagine how suffocating that would be. I actually met him at um, at Reading Festival. Uh during or just before they started filming the last harry potter and we swapped numbers and we're texting oh. back and forth book recommendations he's actually a really really great guy unfortunately that was before we had icloud and um i put on his charity event and went to meet a dj that was djing this charity event and dropped my phone in the back of the taxi and it was a work phone so it was on a contract that i wasn't even paying for um but that work didn't cancel it so whoever got it the phone definitely fell into someone's hands because they were texting my friends and, and with all kinds of 
weirdness pretending to be me. And of course, he was on my phone as Daniel Radcliffe. So I only, I dread to think uh, <laughs> what happened oh, there. Um, I mean, I mean, it's probably one of five that week, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I don't know. Man. I don't know. He's not any other social media, I think, for that reason. But I can only imagine. Hopefully, they didn't get that far through the phone book. Um, so you mentioned in terms of, uh, you know, being in that position of being able to to pick and choose work or be offered lots of work. And I know, you know, uh, I'd say myself, I, I wondered if if um, if Shepherds were were in Hollywood, whether it would have got more recognition, because um, I think it deserved more recognition than it than it actually got. It, is there a thing here about geography? Is South Africa the best place to be? I mean, I spent some time in Hollywood. I was there for about three or four months uh, when I went traveling, and there were you know lots of sort of people who are older than you waiting tables, waiting for the break. And that's that's even in Hollywood. So how much more difficult is that made by by not being in one of these sort of film centers? Yeah, uh, I mean, I'll have to let you know when I see the, the, the contrast, because I am definitely working towards uh, moving over to the UK or the US. Um, but just, yeah, I, I think it's, it's difficult being, I mean, in any country where there isn't an abundance of work because then regardless of, you know, what kind of character you want to be, what kind of person you are, what kind of gender or race you are, you're in a country where there isn't a lot of work, full stop. So, you know, there's people who have complaints about certain scripts and work overseas, and that's already something that we all as actors have an issue with is wanting to play roles that we agree with and wanting to do work that we love and having and being able to turn down scripts and accept others, you know, but um, I think that's only a problem you can have in a country where there is an abundance somewhere like the UK and the US. And we, we here kind of the regular thing is to have, you know, three, two or one big project a year. And we all hear about it and we all kind of, go for it and whoever wins wins so i mean it's it's it, it's great to have a small pond in the sense that you're going to hear about all the opportunities uh, but it's also not great to have a small pond because there's only going to be that one role and out of even if there's only three fish in the pond you know they, they can only cast one so what's that like in in terms of you know the, the circuit there in south africa if there's a relatively small scene of people acting is it is it is it adversarial is there a bit of a team spirit towards it do you sort of tend to know other people that are going for the roles or i mean i'll have to tell you when i see the contrast because i can't really compare it to anything else right now but um there's a there's a pretty big um industry with with a, a few head agencies here i like to put it that way specifically ones that will work with international companies um but it is, as you said, very close knit. Like it's, it is quite difficult for me to go out to an audition and not recognize somebody. Or so, yeah. I think, I think, when we hear about people overseas, and I did uh, once get um, approached by an, an agency in LA, and they sent me, I think it was five self tapes for the first week, and I was shocked at that. And and he explained how you know it's it's the norm over there that guys will be doing up to 12 a week and for us that's that's looking at like sometimes six months you know of a week so I think it's yeah but personally I'm looking forward to seeing the contrast and seeing how I do over there um, but on the other hand the industry here is very very flush um, and very very full of hungry artists and I mean that in every sense of the word people who have a lot that they want to show and a lot that they want to finish writing and to do and I think the problem with film as a whole is that filmmakers often have to wait about four to five years before they get their project made or can start making it because there's so many conversations that have to happen before so what I'm hoping is that's places like South Africa and smaller countries will be able to start and finish and package and, you know, have these films completed a lot faster than other ones because they have a smaller 
uh, pond. And I'm hoping that will start to become a reality soon. It's just obviously all industries have people that have investment, people who want uh, a return on investment, people who want their own out for their in, in instead of it just being a pretty picture we're all painting together. So I think, yeah, it's a very universal issue. I think any in, in issues we have here are pretty much the same as there. I think I'm just very, very jealous of the amount of auditions that I hear people. <laughs> <laughs> Completely. I mean, in some ways, <clears throat> you're doing some bar work, you're, that's very real and out there and, and meeting sort of, you know, lots of different people from different backgrounds. Yeah. So I guess in many ways that could be helpful, not only in terms of if you've been acting from a young age and, and sort of keeping feet on the ground, which, you know, I get the sense from speaking to you, yours very much are, but also in terms of getting that experience that, that then perhaps will feed into to, to future characters from, from people that you've met. Is that a thing? Do you, do you ever bring to your roles experience or interactions or, or, or you know, oh, knowledge yeah. that you've gained from that? Um, I mean, I, I, I often, one of my highest forms of critique, because I think all of us do it when we watch films, is to watch if somebody's drawing on uh, the right emotion or if they've had enough life experience to draw off of something that they're going through now. And you'll, you'll often find if you see a, a young character trying to go through something painful or maybe I'm using too much of an exact example, but if, you, if a, a young guy's trying to go through something painful, they'll often draw on an emotion and start to seem a little bit... Um, younger maybe toddler-esque they're drawing from a pain that they've had you know they they have like a, a a small crying out for help pain and then you might find another person in the same role maybe a year or two older or has just lived a little bit more of a rough life or experienced a few more things and when he goes through pain in the scene you'll be able to see a million different ways he can draw on that pain you know holding back tears or fighting against feeling something or so I think it is it is really really important for actors to be aware of what they're doing with their time when they're not working I think that's more important than how you are when you are working because if you're not using that time right or if you're not constantly having those conversations with yourself you are going to get uh slow you are going to get rusty you know so I think the like you said, real work and behind the bar and getting to know different people from different walks of life. You need that experience to draw on it when you're on on stage or in front of the camera. I don't know you um, you at your girlfriend's at the moment in Cape Town. Um, first, were you guys together when you were shooting these films? And second, you know, when you were doing these quite difficult roles that are quite taxing and quite emotionally, you know, demanding. Do you bring that home? Is it something that you talk about? Do you keep it separate? What, what's, how do you navigate that? Um, yeah, yeah I, I mean, it is, it, it, that's a very good question because sometimes while you're in a relationship and you're doing a role, you will draw on things. You can, if you want to, draw on things from your own relationship and you know that'll stir up emotions in the scene. Uh, but in my own experience, while I was shooting both those films, I was with somebody and... Um, now I found I found it more useful to have that those kind of arguments and those um, you know disagreements and all the other things that can come with having a relationship. Then I found it a hindrance. I found it very useful and um, didn't really bring it home with me. Brought brought home with me to work more than I ever brought work to, with me to home. So I think it it can if you use it that way. If you use it that way, it's a perfect balance. If you go the wrong way, then it's not. And so you said you were 25. How old is your brother? Uh, 25. So he should be now 6, 7, 28. <laughs> also, so pretty, pretty close in terms of age. Uh, and yeah, both in the same industry. Is there, yeah. is there any competition there? <clears throat> oh, definitely. Most definitely. Um, he did a film and we looked so alike. So that's the other thing. But now, I mean, he's getting a bit older. He's nearly 30 and he's got long blonde hair past his nipples and I've got a buzz cut at the moment and we're starting to look a little bit different um the, the beaver days are gone for both of you 
<laughs> yeah, no, I'm gonna start uh, collecting patches, man. <laughs> Bless him. I haven't seen him in in three years. Actually, he's living, as I said, out in Vietnam. So he he left here in 2019, and with COVID, we haven't been able to see each other. So I'm quite looking forward oh. to seeing him. But um, yeah. he has. He's got a film a film named. American Girl. That that'll be the one and only that we ever competed for, kind of, but not really. Um, I just heard about the film. They were interested in me with my agency, and then they approached him as well with his agency, and then he went for the role, and I didn't get the chance to go for the role. So we don't know who would have won there, but he definitely <laughs> <did. laughs> maybe that's for the best. How is he finding you know Vietnam in COVID? Because I know two people who are out there and both have really struggled with some of the some of the lockdowns and obviously you know when you're in a in a in a country that you're that you're not you know it's not your culture and then and then you're you know that can be difficult in the first place to, to sort of get yourself out there and then to be living through a lockdown you know how has he coped with that have you have you spoke much about that yeah no that was quite intense especially at the right at the beginning of lockdown when none of us really knew just how serious it was going to get and we were all in full lockdown, they had they were really good about it there. I won't I won't deny that. Vietnam were exceptionally on it. <laughs> um, yeah. And all the guys from overseas were obviously put together in these hostels and they were in, in lockdown. And um, it was quite interesting because we were sulking here in uh, South Africa because we had a liquor ban, which was and cigarettes, so we couldn't get cigarettes or alcohol. And it was obviously you can imagine an entire country like <laughs> a country the UK very would not go that, that the I can tell you yeah but, I mean it's very similar to that of the UK and Australia so I mean you can imagine what we're all like when all the liquor stores closed and we're all stuck at home um and I, I noticed Connor was hey, that's my brother um Connor was in Vietnam at the time and him and his friends were finding ways to smuggle in vodka and you know they all had their cigarettes and they'd like right it was kind of like boarding school for him so in essence it looked appearance wise a bit more intense for him but i think with the with the leniency on the alcohol and the cigarettes it was a bit bit nicer for him than it was for us okay so you've spoken about the sort of the positives and negatives of, of an acting career and and what you've taken from it and, and some of the things that it's taken from you if anyone's listening to this in there either just starting out or even thinking about getting into the acting industry, what good advice have you received in the past that's done you well? And what advice would you give to them? Um, so my own father said no to me um, when I said that that was what I wanted to pursue when I was 18 and he himself's an actor. So I took that quite, uh, quite well actually. Um, and I think when it comes to being an actor, you need to be sure that it's it's something that regardless of, I, I think that's the lesson I was trying to get there was my dad said no, and I still ended up going for it and still doing it. And um, that's coming from someone I've watched struggle as an actor trying to live between jobs. And, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult thing lifestyle and it is that too it's not going to just be your career it's going to be your lifestyle um but if if you i mean you'll know if if if, if regardless of what i say now you're still going to want to pursue that every day and it's the only thing you know how to do or want to do then it's it, then it's in you then you're kind of you have no choice um steve coogan actually after shepherds left me with a book um called i an actor and it's a really, really good read. Um, it's I an actor, and um, it really goes into what the periods of not working are going to be like. Um, and 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 you know, it, it's it's got to be. I don't know. It's it, it's a difficult thing to recommend as an actor to to someone else because you you, you I, I get approached a lot by a lot of people saying, "Hey, can you get me into the industry?" I see you're an actor. How can I be an actor? And to be honest, the actors that are out here trying, we're, we're struggling ourselves. You know, it's not something we recommend, but it's something we have to do. I, I feel if I need to articulate a certain way I, or period of my life and, you know, go through it therapeutically, 
or learn from another situation and, and, and add it to who I am as a person, then this is the career that I have to follow because I want to be able to look at as many different points of view and experience as many different situations as I can, ones that I might not ever be in myself so that I can have a bigger view overall. And if that's what your inspire is that your inspiration for wanting to be an actor then I don't think anyone could ever tell you not to be um, but obviously it is we are living in a time where it's becoming more and more about other things and we've got to be careful about that as well um, obviously you need to have a profile and you need to be a business if you want to work but you know it's an, it's if, if you want to be an actor because you want to see your face in art or you want to see your face over things then you will feel very empty very quickly and um i think yeah it, it, it all comes down to what you what you look at in everyday life and how you experience life and how you'd want to continue experiencing life and then you'd know if you want to be an actor or not so not to be cliche it always has to be in your blood I was, my next question was going to be you know what is it can you can you put your finger on what keeps you coming back and i think you've actually i haven't had to ask that you've, you've, you've articulated that really really well um, so, shortly going to be time to wrap up. What's 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 the future looking like? What are your your intentions moving forward? What's what's on the horizon? What's coming up? And also, you know, how can people keep up with you? Do you have any social media or things that can be followed to keep an eye out for for things that are uh, happening for you moving forward? Glad you've asked. There's a I've got a project in the limelight. Um, I'm going to start shooting actually on Friday. And it's a, a series called Revelation Road. Um, there were three films before, um, and they all, uh, it's a US series, and they're all US films. <clears throat> I've got a, quite an exciting character, um, quite a, a villain, which I'm, I'm quite excited for. I don't want to spoil too much, but he's, he's, uh, yeah, he's, not, he's, not, he's not very nice to look at. Um, and um, yeah, I'm kind of delving into into that. I haven't been quite as excited as I am right now for a character in a while. So that's shooting um, this month and next month. And then um, might be doing a bit of theater after that, um, but I'll keep you posted, Gav. And um, if anyone would like to follow me, I have been terrible with my social media, um, but I am on Twitter and Instagram. Um, and I will be posting more in the coming months. So uh, that's Gaz Doubt or Gary and Doubt for Instagram. And uh, Twitter, I think, should be the same. I've tried to keep it all just my name. Cool. So it's, it's sorry, is it, is it Gary and Doubt? Uh, one of them is Gary and Doubt. One of them is Gaz Doubt. I'll have a look at that. <laughs> um, it is. Gary and Dowd's username, Gaz Dowd. Is that for, for both Twitter and Instagram? I think for Twitter, it'll be Gary and Dowd's. If, if you see R2D2 slapping some bass, then that's me. <laughs> <laughs> I've been telling myself, obviously, I've got you on, on Twitter. Really. It's Gary and, yeah. at Gary and Dowd's, G A R I O N D O W D S. And so this project you're working on just upcoming where will that be available where can we see it and when i'm actually hoping it's going to be on um netflix but probably uh one of the streaming channels one of the streaming sites in the, the u.s first and foremost so the minute i find out about that i'll let you know where it'll be available in the uk it'll probably only be coming out around 2023 20, 24 Brilliant. So keep an eye on your on your Insta and Twitter. I know that you put that out on there when it drops. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Gary, it's been an absolute pleasure to speak to you, Nate. And thanks so much for, for giving up your time today to have this chat. I've really enjoyed it. Um, it's been a pleasure myself. Yeah. Thank you. Keep in touch. Keep us updated. Thanks ever so much. Awesome. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Got Your Six Lads Advice Encounters with me, Gap Topley, and actor Gary and Dowds. To keep up with Gary and his projects and releases, you can do so at Twitter at Gary and Dowds or Insta at Gaz Dowds. 
You can, of course, contact us via the Facebook group, Lads Advice, by email, ladsadvice at hotmail.com, Insta, lads underscore advice, or on Twitter, advice underscore lads. You can support our fundraising for Papyrus Prevention of Young Suicide at www.justgiving.com forward slash fundraising forward slash Chaz and Gav smash Killy. Finally, you can support the group on patreon.com forward slash Gav Topley. Thanks for listening and we'll see you next week.